I know I'm nervous to talk about this in Greece. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just want to say thanks to uh, Andreas and the Fame Lab and everyone actually at Tefa for hosting us this past three weeks. Um, we've been here with, um, here, I'm here with four undergraduate students from, from Chatham University uh, and this is, uh, has been a great experience for all of us. We really appreciate um, all your generosity and the time spent with you guys. It's been excellent. And we really appreciate the opportunity to present uh, in this Science Innovation Forum. So, yes, uh, just to kind of introduce this topic, it's sort of, uh, it is a proposal for future research. It is about physical performance, but really it's about a little bit more than that. So, really, it's sort of talking about a different uh, way of thinking uh, with respect to diet, exercise, and health. So we're looking at diet, right, um, and how it influences health, but also physical performance. And, but again, we're not going to go into too much depth with data and information from that point of view. We really sort of want to introduce different ways of thinking about nutrition. So with that, um, when you start to think differently, it's important to sort of question the starting point. So a big part of this talk and a lot of what we've been thinking about is, you know, starting points. Um, a lot of times we take starting points for granted, we don't question them, and we just kind of follow them blindly, mechanically, without any sort of um, thought with respect to their usefulness. So. Here we're sort of questioning the starting point with respect to, to diet and uh, health and, and physical performance. And so the starting point um, question that we have is, are our current nutritional guidelines appropriate for improving the health and performance of the general population? And so when I say our current nutritional guidelines, I'm really referring to the guidelines put forth by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and these guidelines are essentially consistent across North America. Okay, so that's our starting point. That's where we, when we're looking for information on improving our health and improving our performance, we look at these guidelines for, uh, for help. Okay, that's what the general population does, and that's what we're questioning today with this. So, if you look at the top 10 leading causes of death in North America, you'll see these uh, causes of death marked in bold here, right? Heart disease is number one, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, and diabetes. Now, I highlight those because there's a strong relationship with your risk of developing these diseases and your diet. And so what you eat impacts your risk of, of developing these certain de diseases. And so again, when trying to avoid developing these sort of conditions, you look at the current guidelines for help, okay? And so with that, I wanted to just introduce these diseases and what we're gonna do is sort of summarize the current nutritional guidelines put forth by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and you'll see some sort of consistencies um, arise from this. And actually, Caitlin's going to, uh, to walk us through those guidelines and then we'll sort of uh, continue from there. So they have a basis online. You can find it online. You find it everywhere. They'll have it posted in um, companies. They'll have it inside your workplace, just as reminders for you to eat healthy and to live a healthy lifestyle to avoid these diseases that we previously mentioned. So the first one they talk about is to follow a healthy eating pattern. And this is more so throughout your whole lifespan. So no matter what you're going through, um, you need to eat for what you're doing at that moment in time in your life. Uh, to can you continue on, um, they really focus on calorie intake and calorie output. So you want to balance those and keep those at a healthy level. Oh. Um, and then they focus on variety, nutrition density, and the amount of it. So they want you to make sure that you're, use you're eating a variety of foods. Um, you're covering all of your categories, which I'll mention later, and that you're not just eating the same thing in every category, you're providing diversity throughout it. And then they also talk again about limiting your calories, your added sugars, your saturated fats. They want you to almost avoid these 
and at least limit them to the best of your ability through the food that's provided by your grocery stores or what's at hand or what is convenient for your lifestyle. And then they also say to shift to healthier food and beverages. So instead of having sodas and um, alcohol, you're going to have water and juices. Um, and then again, they kind of reiterate and um, repeat themselves about having healthy eating patterns. So you'll go through the role of helping others continue. So as I mentioned before, they have these um, posted in workplaces, they have them in cafeterias and so forth and so on. And it actually looks like this, and this is their visual aspect to <coughs> continually remind you that you need to be eating healthy and that you need to have each of these food groups so they show you they have fruits, grains, vegetables, protein. So your fruits and vegetables will make up for about 50%, whereas your grains and proteins will make up for the other 50%. And in general, it's just so that you guys can see these symbols and you think it's a reminder, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow these guidelines so that I don't, I'm not increasing my ability or my aspect to have those um, diseases that we mentioned in the first place. Overall, if you look at their, the my plate, which was the visual aspect, it shows that it's a high carb, low fat intake. They don't want you taking in saturated fats and extra sodium, but your carbs come from your fruits and your grains and your vegetables. So that's most of your plate. So what Caitlin just mentioned is really important, um, but also kind of useless because the, the guidelines are very vague, very general, very sort of, I mean, not with a lot of detail um, and usefulness. So the, the main points, right, um, sort of a higher carbohydrate, low fat diet that's sort of been since the 70s and, and we'll talk about how that came to be but that's sort of one of the main themes. The other main theme is to balance your calories in versus your calories out. Okay, So the more calories you consume, the less you expend, you'll um, add, uh, put on weight. Okay, So that's the idea. So keep that in mind as we go through uh, this discussion because these are the big sort of highlights from the current nutritional guidelines put forth uh, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Another important point, no more than 30% of total calories from fat, okay? Anywhere from above or below, it's problematic, so 30% is the, is the number. Okay, moving from, that was sort of a discussion on health, a little short summary, moving into physical performance. Really, uh, the conventional wisdom, right, the, the typical guidelines for enhancing physical performance. Let's be a little bit more specific and say endurance performance, okay, um, would sort of follow, again, sort of a higher carbohydrate approach, like carb loading we've all become quite familiar with. And the idea with carb loading is to maximize your glycogen stores or your stored glucose by consuming uh, significant amounts of carbohydrate, right? Um, the problem is, is we don't have much of a storage capacity when it comes to carbohydrate. We have, we can store up to about 2,000 kilocals. So we have to consume a lot of carbohydrate before exercise. We have to consume a lot during exercise, depending on the activity. And then we have to consume a lot after exercise to replenish our glycogen stores. So we essentially become dependent on uh, glucose as an energy source. So in that case, we end up consuming a lot of sports drinks, glucose gels, energy bars, a lot of uh, foods that, can, that are very high in sugar, okay? So this is sort of the idea. Here's an example of a pre-competition meal suggested from a typical exercise and nutrition textbook, okay? Um, again, the goal is to maximize your glycogen stores in the muscle and the liver. Uh, the ideal pre-competition meal would contain anywhere from 150 to 300 grams of carbohydrate consumed about three to four hours before competition, okay? And that meal should contain little fat and protein. So 150 to 300 grams of carbohydrate is kind of a lot um, and for some quite difficult to consume um, 
in one sitting, okay? So how did we get to this point? So now we're going back to questioning this, these starting points. And so, as I mentioned previously, this whole idea of low fat became popular, especially in the United States within the 19, uh, during the 1970s. And it was uh, an individual, um, has anyone heard of Ansel Keys? He was an epidemiologist who worked at the University of Minnesota. And he was uh, investigating nutrition um, within the, the field of epidemiology, did a lot of traveling, investigated a lot of important information, particularly with respect to diet and the development of um, heart disease and mortality. And so he became quite uh, famous in the 70s for his research. And what he found after conducting what was called the seven country study, so he collected data from seven countries, um, North America, the UK, uh, also more throughout Europe, and found basically a correlation between fat intake, just straight up fat intake as a percentage of total calories, and mortality from coronary heart disease. So the more fat you consumed, the greater the risk of mortality from heart disease. So the main idea behind this, behind these findings were that as fat intake increases, cholesterol will increase. Uh, cholesterol is found in the arterial plaques described earlier by Professor Jarmutas. And so therefore fat intake must increase heart disease. Okay, so this is the fat cholesterol hypothesis. Okay, that's been around for quite some time, uh, developed by Ansel Keys in the 70s from this research. So this has been heavily criticized. It was heavily criticized at the time, but eventually it did catch on. Okay, it's important as we have all become aware several times that relationships don't actually imply causality. So there was a lot of sort of speculation based on this uh, type of research conducted by Ansel Keys. The other important thing that was not emphasized as much, okay, is that not only was dietary fat associated with an increased risk of mortality from heart disease, so was added sugar, okay? So they didn't mention that important piece of information. So it wasn't only the fat which got all the attention, it was also the added sugar. And if you combine fat and sugar together, you have something like donuts, right? So it becomes a very different situation when you actually think about what is being shown with these data. So the main culprits then were saturated fat and cholesterol. And there's actually sort of weak evidence published for both of these culprits uh, with respect to their influence on the development of heart disease. So some gaps. Okay, so the link between saturated fat consumption and cholesterol, already the dietary guidelines published this year removed dietary cholesterol as a concern for increasing your risk of heart disease because they realized there's a really weak connection between how much cholesterol we eat and how much cholesterol is in our blood. Okay, that seems to be, that relationship just doesn't seem to be very strong if you read through the literature. Cholesterol levels in heart attacks. So also Professor Jarmutas mentioned that there's a, several um, uh, research papers that show individuals who actually have high levels of cholesterol don't experience any heart disease. Or there are individuals who have major heart attacks with lower levels of cholesterol. So there's a little gap in the understanding there. And then there's the carbohydrate, in, the problem with carbohydrate intake in some individuals, not everybody, in some individuals, carbohydrate intake and your risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Okay, so there's a, there's a connection there as well. So here's a meta-analysis that was published um, in 2010 that looked at the ev evaluating the association of saturated fat with cardiovascular disease. Okay, and what they found was that there is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease, right? So it goes sort of against what we've been sort of told uh, or what our starting point has been since the 1970s, okay? And 
This is just one example. There are a lot of papers that have been accumulating to support this particular contention. So we get back to this point of well, questioning what's going on here because in North America especially, they've become very, very obedient with these uh, guidelines. So everyone seems to be following them. Fat intake has decreased extensively, right? Everyone's buying these low fat products that are of course full of sugar, but um, they're, they are following these, uh, these guidelines, but the problems continue to, to, to increase. Obesity, heart disease, especially childhood obesity, um, and, and type 2 diabetes. So there's still a lot of problems. So obviously we have to go back and sort of question these starting points, right, these guidelines. So are our current nutritional guidelines appropriate for improving the health and performance of the general population? So again, as I mentioned, this isn't a way, because if you go onto Twitter and you search uh, low carbohydrate diets, you'll see some angry people talking about this as an example. You'll have people at one end of the spectrum and people at the other end of the spectrum who, very, who hate each other. And so this is a, a common theme in nutrition uh, research, nutrition discussions that you have with people. And uh, I have a, a professor of mine uh, refers to it as either orness. So this is good, this is bad. Um, high levels of this is good, low levels of this is bad. It's really sort of a simplistic view in almost anything, but especially with respect to nutrition research, right? So we have these two camps sort of developing. You have your conventional wisdom individuals who say, okay, high carbohydrate, low fat is good, but high fat, low carbohydrate is bad. You have these two extremes sort of developing uh, in, the, uh, in the literature and on Twitter, right? So an alternative approach that is developing looking at the other end of the spectrum, low carbohydrate, high fat, which has been around for quite some time as well. You can't ignore it. It's been around for, for a while. This was an interesting study and I had to include it because it showed some great results with respect to the Mediterranean diet. So published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at not only weight loss, they looked at a number of other important uh, factors uh, following a two-year study that implemented either a low carbohydrate diet Mediterranean diet or a low fat diet that sort of represents the guidelines put forth by that we discussed earlier. And so what the results found was that by far the low carbohydrate Mediterranean style eating was a lot more effective for this particular group of individuals. Doesn't mean that that's the case for everyone, but for these participants they were a lot more it was a lot more effective in not only for weight loss but also cholesterol levels, triglyceride levels, inflammatory markers, um, markers, metabolic markers that would indicate type 2 diabetes and such. So it was, uh, it was uh, definitely something in support of uh, this low carb sort of approach. And again, only one example, there's many others. So uh, low carbohydrate, high fat diets, um, research is definitely accumulating to support this alternative approach. Uh, the emphasis though, as Caitlin mentioned, is really, really important that the guidelines, okay, state calories in, calories out, you have to balance that, right? This is a very sort of simplistic view of nutrition. It's a lot more complex than that because you don't really question, well, why are my calories in much higher than my calories out? What's causing this to happen? So there's a lot of and, and that's sort of beyond this discussion, but there's a lot more going on there than calories in, calories out. So what seems to be going on is these low-carb, high-fat diets m emphasize more the type of foods that, are consume that you're consuming, not so much the amount of calories, right? The cal caloric content isn't really considered. It's more, what am I eating? Um, ex some examples include Atkins, the paleo diet, and the ketogenic diet. So we'll talk briefly about the paleo diet and ketogenic diet. We've collected some preliminary data uh, looking at the paleo diet and we're, we're sort of starting a, a study um, looking at the ketogenic diet, particularly with respect to performance. So the paleo diet <clears throat> is a, 
<clears throat> gaining a lot of popularity, uh, especially among younger generation uh, individuals, based uh, on the type of foods presumed to have been eaten by early humans. This presumption okay, may not be accurate, but it, even if it is inaccurate, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that, that the diet is ineffective or anything. But that's the idea, that you're consuming what, uh, that what would have been consumed during the Paleolithic era. So really, you're consuming a lot of uh, meat, especially high-quality meat, fish. You wouldn't be eating at uh, McDonald's, let's say. Uh, vegetables, nuts, and fruit. And then you exclude... Uh, dairy products, cereal products, baked goods, processed food. So it's, it's a very sort of uh, clean uh, diet and it does tend to be more of a higher fat content as a percentage of total calories, lower carbohydrate content usually. Um, again, here's another example. Studies are accumulating to show that even though your, percent your fat consumption as a, total, as a percentage of total calories goes up, right, um, plasma lipid concentrations, okay, the, the whole view of your cholesterol, triglycerides and such, seems to improve even though your fat content um, increases. Okay? So that's something that is continued to uh, be shown in the literature. So what we did, we, as I mentioned, we collected uh, some pilot data to look at the, at the paleo diet. We just we looked at um, a four-week paleo dietary intervention on metabolic uh, immune health and, and anthrop anthropometric uh, measurements. So we had eight participants um, volunteer for this study and they uh, this pilot study, and they followed the paleo diet for four weeks. We basically gave we provided them with a brochure of what the paleo diet is, uh, handed it to them, and said, "Look, these are the here's an example for of a shopping list. Here's." some foods that you can eat, here's what you'd want to avoid while on this diet. We didn't tell them, that's all we told them, we didn't say don't eat too much, we didn't say watch your portions, we didn't say anything about that, we just said this is what you should eat and this, don't eat that, okay? Um, we took some measurements before and after the four week period, we also took a blood sample taken at baseline and after four weeks. So what we found was sort of interesting. Okay, so we found a significant decrease in total kilocal intake. So, and again, this was assessed just by a three-day dietary record, right? And we found a, a significant decrease. So they decreased their caloric intake, even though we, we gave them no instruction on that at all. We, we said, eat as much as you want of these foods. The other significant decrease was a decrease in carbohydrate um, levels. So 157 grams down to about 88. Uh, fat and protein seem to uh, remain somewhat similar. So if you look at this, it was basically a decrease in carbohydrate. Uh, fat as a percentage of total calories therefore did go up, but the absolute amount remained uh, similar. So if you look at some of the anthrop anthropometric data, there was a significant decrease in weight for these uh, eight individuals. Uh, um, 4.8 uh, kilo kilograms in that four-week period. Uh, BMI, significant decrease. Waist circumference, 6.3 centimeters. And some of skin folds significantly decreased as well. Okay, Four weeks and these eight participants for these pilot data. Uh, we have some partners at the University of Houston who are currently measuring uh, inflammatory markers in the blood samples and, and some metabolic measures as well. So we don't have those data yet, but they're, they're uh, coming soon. So that was what we started with. Um, we found some interesting sort of pilot um, results, and now we're sort of wanting to move even further toward that extreme, right, that high fat, low carbohydrate uh, approach, which is again the alternative method. And so we are moving into a ketogenic diet, which Caitlin will sort of describe now. Um, and we'll sort of, we'll end kind of with this part of the discussion. So for my study that I'm doing with Dr. Curlo, we're looking into the <coughs> ketogenic diet. What exactly is a ketogenic diet? It is a high fat, ad adequate protein and very low carb diet. Um, this diet will cause the individual or the subject 
to hopefully um, obtain nutritional ketosis, which means that their body is burning fat instead of um, glucose as their primary fuel source. So if you're looking at a ketogenic diet um, and you're trying to follow it, and when we give our guidelines to our subjects, it'll be 60 to 80% of your diet is going to be fat intake. And these are just general, just fats. Um, 10 to 15% of these are gonna be from carbohydrates. So from a day-to-day -day basis looking at that, that's gonna be equal to or less than 50 grams a day, which is not a lot. If you think about it, one piece of bread can range from 15 to 30 carbs, depending on where the bread's from, how it's made, what it's from. Um, and so with this diet, um, your muscle and liver gl glycogen is going to be um, kind of saved up. And so you can use it for when you're going through high intensity training. And so for this diet, from other uh, studies that we've looked into, it has, uh, they need anywhere from two to four weeks in order to adapt to this, and it has been referred to as keto adaptation. So going in to the actual body and looking at this, we have three ketones here, um, and with these ketones, they'll be measured throughout the process in order to make sure that the body's going into ketosis. Um, and a key one that we would want to emphasize is the middle one here, and that's beta-hydroxyburate, which is also known as BOHB. So there has been a study that we looked into, and it was consisted of eight cyclists, um, and they did this study for six weeks, and they had a daily intake of 10 grams of carbohydrates, which is very minimal, almost nothing. And so their BOHB was measured, and in these cyclists, the average was between one to three millimoles per liter. And then we also looked at, they also looked at the respiratory exchange ratio, which is RER, and they found that more than 90% of the metabolic fuel was from fat oxidation. So they went into full ketosis. Um, so within the study that we're looking, that we're proposing, or I'm proposing, um, I would like to do a baseline test before they start any type of nutrition, before they know anything about it, any of that. Um, we'll do a baseline test and that'll consist of, um, we'll take a blood sample, we'll have their um, hip, hip to waist ratio, circumference, height, weight, the general, and um, it will consist of four weeks in order to hopefully have them go through ketosis. In these um, subjects, we want two groups. It'll be controlled and intervention. Our intervention group will be given a dietary brochure for them to um, follow, similar to what Dr. Carrillo mentioned before with other paleo studies. Um, these subjects will range anywhere from 18 to 55 years old, male, male or female. Um, we will give them We'll have them take two surveys to identify how aerobically fit they are and physically fit. And they need to be free of any cardiovascular diseases. So again, the idea is not, you know, the details of the study and all that. We know there's a lot that needs to go into developing this project even further. That's not the idea for this talk, although we wanted to share some of that. Um, and I'll explain what the, the main sort of closing point is. But um, so the outcome variables with this study that we would like to, to look at. So we are, as Caitlin uh, described, going to recruit aerobically fit individuals, individuals who, who, um, who are physically active. And we're going to have them perform a VO2 max test once per week throughout that four-week period. And we want to look at um, peak fat oxidation during that uh, VO2 max test. So that's one thing that we want to look at. And again, the idea, right, is that glucose, uh, stored glucose, stored uh, glycogen, right, that storage is limited with respect to the amount of fat we can store. So if we can tap into our fat stores, we could have 
fuel available to us more efficiently for a longer period of time. So we're looking to see how that shifts during that four week period by having them perform this, these VO2 max tests. We also, at baseline weeks two and week four, hope to collect a blood sample to assess ketones, uh, inflammatory markers, um, metabolic markers, again, by the University of Houston, and uh, markers of oxidative stress. We've been, for the past two weeks, um, the students and I have been in the biochemistry lab um, with uh, Professor Jarmutas Hara and Poppy, who have been very generous with their time showing us these techniques. So we hope to implement those techniques um, for this particular project. So the other kind of cool thing, um, we're just going to close up here shortly. The other sort of cool uh, relationship here that we've, uh, we've come across over the past year or so uh, ketogenic diet increases brown adipose tissue mitochondrial proteins and UCP1 levels in mice. So interesting sort of relationship there. I wanted to include this because of the um, topics discussed yesterday. So there's some interesting relationships there with this high fat uh, diet and, um, and BAT activity in mice, of course. So just in closing, right, the idea uh, behind this, the most important thing is to is to stop with um, the this either orness approach to nutrition. So it's not that high carb, low fat is good or bad. It doesn't. It doesn't. There's that's a meaningless sort of statement because it ignores context completely. We need to determine who for who is high carb, low fat good for, and when per, perhaps. So the same idea. Low carb, high fat is not good or bad. It really depends. So the starting point isn't, oh sorry, the starting point isn't this or this, right? The starting point is this and this. It depends on who you're talking about. Um, context, a description of context is really, really important. So it not only depends on the individual, it depends on when uh, and what is going on with that individual. So. Um, that's the sort of the, uh, I guess, take home message is to avoid this either orness approach to, uh, to nutrition um, and, and sort of embrace this wider view uh, with respect to your starting point in nutrition. Thanks. Hmm.